Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Towergate day number 1097. 1097, Thursday, April the 9th, 2020. Thank you so much for tuning in. Okay, so uh, doing this video tonight and uh, Mother Nature is in a bit of an ornery mood. <laughs> That's why I got the door open so you guys can enjoy it with me. Yes, we've got uh, thunder, lightning, rain, hail, and tornado warnings out. But that's okay, because uh, maybe the video starts in Ohio and ends in Kansas. And you'll get to experience the whole thing right along with me. <laughs> let's hope not. Okay, so let's go ahead and get to the news of the day. Not a really a big news day, but uh, let's get through the, uh, some of the topics here and, uh, and uh, see what we have. Okay, so most of you heard by now, uh, Commie Bernie uh, has dropped out. Commie Bernie has dropped out. So what does that mean? Well, it means a lot of things probably that I don't have time to go into everything, but let's just cover a few of the main things. Uh, well, obviously uh, they found uh, Bernie's number. <laughs> so I don't know what Bernie got out of this, but I guess we'll find out, uh, if, you know, here in a couple weeks if uh, Bernie is uh, uh, just coming to a brand new Gulf Stream 5. <laughs> so I know he would like to have a private jet because we know as a, as a commie, uh, he would love to have a private jet for him and Jane to fly around and sell uh, more communism. Um, now, this probably means a lot to the Rotten Reverend Clinton uh, because now that uh, commie Bernie has stepped aside, uh, although he hasn't ended his campaign, like everyone else, he suspended his campaign, which means that his name will continue to be on the ballot and he will continue to pick up a few delegates here and there, although it's likely now since he's suspended his campaign that uh, his support will drop and, and, uh, uh, quite a bit. Uh, and he wasn't going to win hardly. I think he was only favored to win maybe one of uh, the next eight or nine primaries. So it wasn't. It's not really going to matter in terms of delegates. It's it's not really going to matter at all. Uh, it could maybe keep Biden from securing the number of delegates he needs uh, uh, it, uh, to get to the convention w w and close the deal. Uh, I, I guess, but um, I don't know. It's it's hard to say at this point. And I, I still believe that something's got to happen for the. Uh, demo commies to do something about Biden. I still find it very difficult to believe that they are going to uh, go ahead and uh, roll with Biden. Uh, it just seems very, very difficult to, to believe that they would try that. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a looming disaster. Uh, it's just, it's this, I, I guess if, if there weren't going to be any debates or anything like that and they could just hide uh, Biden and just run commercials and have surrogates come out and do a speaking for him, they could maybe drag him across the finish line uh, and maybe he could have some kind of a respectable showing in November and would maybe help the Democrats turn out uh, so they hold on to the House and uh, maybe uh, pick up a seat or two in the Senate. I think that that's their game plan. But when you think about the optics of, of, of three debates with Trump, uh, you know, that could be disastrous. I mean, really disastrous. Uh, it, it's a very, very risky move. Now, I think that the rotten Reverend Clinton, now that Commie Bernie is pretty much out of the way, will start sharpening her knives uh, as she will now uh, move Biden out of the way. Because with Biden out of the way, there really aren't, there really aren't very many alternatives for uh, the demo commies. Uh, a lot of people talk about uh, Michael Obama, but uh, big hands Michael Obama, uh, I don't think wants anything to do with uh, going back to D.C. in any way, shape, or form. Uh, so I, I think that's a that's a non-starter. Um, I really don't believe that Andrew Cuomo uh, is uh, the answer to their problems, and I don't. I, I believe him when he says he really doesn't want the job. But, uh, he could be, uh, you know, lying. Uh, but you know, there's one sound clip uh, is all the Republicans need to take care of Cuomo, and that is that sound clip from when he uh, made the statement uh, back uh, quite a few months ago, where he said America is not great and America has never been great. Uh, that is a sound clip for the ages, and it's one that would just absolutely devastate uh, Kumo. Just that one sound clip says so much about Kumo. And he's got a lot of other problems. Uh, you know, if you want to dig into his handling uh, of the crisis there in New York, uh, all, you know, there's a, there's a litany of things, uh, that, that uh, errors that were made there. Uh, he's not a strong candidate. I mean, he's just not. Now, compared to, to, to Joe Biden, uh, this tree right, right out here in my yard is a formidable candidate. Uh, for uh, Burisma Joe, but <clears throat> we will see, but it seems to me that the only person who can step in and fill the shoes of Burisma Joe is the rotten Reverend Clinton. Uh, she's the only one that's got the name recognition, 
Uh, she's got national organization already on the ground. All she has to do is flip the switch and turn it on. Uh, she's got the support of all those super delegates. She's got the support of the money class on Wall Street. Uh, and there is no one really who would get in her way if she made it clear that she was now uh, the better choice for the demo commies uh, in November over Biden. And she won't have very much uh, uh, difficulty in making that argument. And her surrogates will be out there making the argument. This is exactly what she's been waiting for. This is why she's been sitting on the sidelines throwing Molotov cocktails. This is why she's been continuing to write these books that, she, that no one's probably going to buy, giving these speeches, making the trips, doing the media appearances. This is why she's kept herself in the game, uh, kind of on the sidelines, waiting for the, uh, sur the survival of the fittest. She's waiting for each weak Democrat candidate to fail along the way, leaving the eventual large failure, which would be the establishment candidate, and she knew all this, which would be Burisma Joe. She always knew that Burisma Joe was going to be the guy she had to take out in order to come in and fill the power vacuum. And uh, of course, Commie Bernie, uh, of course, is a thorn in her side, was in 2016 and was uh, again this year, and, uh, but she knew that he eventually would be pushed aside as well. So it's just been a waiting game for the rotten Reverend Clinton. Uh, and so now that uh, Commie Bernie is out of the way, uh, I would say that the rotten Reverend Clinton will start to marshal her, uh, uh, her forces uh, and they will begin to uh, make their move. Uh, she is deeply unpopular in the country, even included in the Demo Commie party. They want nothing to do with her either. But she really doesn't care <laughs> what the Demo Commies want. Um, and I think she probably even knows that she would likely lose. <laughs> she doesn't care either. She'd be happy to be a three-time martyr. Um, so what, things are picking up? <laughs> things are picking up. Uh, let's see. And, of course, now another thing that's a really big, big problem for Brisma Joe is that the Bernie, the uh, commie Bernie uh, bros and uh, all their surrogates are now going to have this tremendous leverage that they're going to use on the demo commies and particularly on Burisma Joe. They've already forced him to go way to the left of where he wanted to be. He wanted to run as the centrist candidate, kind of the Obama, uh, third uh, term of Obama. But um, uh, he was forced in the primary to go so far to the left now that he's even, uh, you know, uh, not really a viable candidate on a national uh, scale. But you can expect that the uh, Bernie bros and the far leftist progressives are going to use their position to try to force Biden to take a lot of Bernie's positions to move him farther to the left to get him, because right now, uh, Burisma Joe and the demo commies know that they can't win without uh, a significant portion, 90% probably or, uh, or better, of commie Bernie supporters to come out uh, for Biden. and. They all know that most uh, uh, commie Bernie supporters despise uh, the establishment Democrats more than they uh, despise Trump. <laughs> so it's going to be a tough sell trying to get the Bernie bros to come on board for, for uh, Brisma Joe. But they know that they have to make some sort of a, uh, an overture, at least to the demo commies, to the Bernie bros, to try to pull them in. I don't think they're going to have very much success at that, but they know they have to try. But in the process, it's going to pull Bernie or a Brisma Joe even more to the left than he already is. And um, he will go out and speak in general terms about how we need to unite the party to, to beat Trump. But what the Bernie bros want is for uh, Biden to give specific things that he is going to implement in his platform along with the demo commies uh, that are uh, from, the, from the Bernie uh, playbook. And that's where it gets very difficult for the demo commies and for Brisma Joe. What specific things about the Bernie platform can the Demo Commies and, and, and Brisma Joe put into Biden's and the Democrats' platform in 2020 that will, uh, that will appease uh, the Bernie bros? And I would suggest there's really nothing there. There's just nothing to work with. And uh, so I don't think they're going to be effective at this at all. Uh, and I do believe that you're going to see what you saw in 2016, which is you're going to see a lot of Bernie bros are going to vote third party. In fact, I would expect you might see more Bernie bros vote for the Green Party in 2020 than you did in 2016. You'll see some stay home, and you'll see a few go over to Trump. Uh, I don't think that Brisma Joe is going to bring in uh, any more of the Bernie bros than the rotten Reverend Clinton did. And I think uh, it'll, it'll be very, very um, devastating. You know, when you look at the states that Trump turned, blue states he turned red, and these battleground states, uh, 
uh, a lot of the things that hurt the right Reverend Clinton in Michigan, Pennsylvania, uh, places like that, Ohio, are the same uh, problems that uh, that Brisbane Joe is going to have because he's been pulled so far to the left on the Green New Deal, on uh, fossil fuels, on fracking, and all these things. He's taken similar or even more hardcore positions than the right Reverend Clinton on these issues, and so when he gets into coal country and uh, places where they do a lot of fracking, where they do oil extraction, natural gas extraction. Uh, this is the sort of the uh, the uh, this is this is the area of the country where where Democrats have to pick off a few of them states. They need to get Pennsylvania back, uh, and I just don't see it happening. I don't see that Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, Virginia, West Virginia, uh, Michigan. Uh, I, I just don't see Indiana. Uh, I, I just don't see where Burisma Joe is going to do any better than, than the Rotten Reverend Clinton did, and I think he could do uh, likely worse. And, and, and the Democrats need to win those states because they're not going to win Florida. If they can't win Florida, then they have to pick off Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania, and, and Michigan. But I think uh, odds are very good at this point where, with where uh, Burisma Joe has been forced so far to the left on things dealing with fracking, natural gas extraction, oil extraction, things and such, trade. Uh, and all these things, I think that um, I just don't. I just don't think that, that Biden's going to be able to uh, do any better than Right Reverend Clinton. And uh, so, you know, the Democrats have to either win Florida or they have to win all these uh, states: so Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania uh, states. And and I, I don't think that uh, Biden will do any better there than the Right Reverend did. In fact, I think that uh, Biden will do actually worse. So. Anyway, uh, this this sets up a lot of things here, but uh, I don't. I, I still think that uh, I think it's at least 50-50, maybe more than 50-50, that, that the Democrats are going to realize at some point uh, that they simply cannot go with uh, Burisma Joe. I think that they've had to put up a facade uh, while Bernie was around because they couldn't give Bernie the, uh, any any room, breathing room. But now that he's gone, uh, I do expect that uh, the Rotten Reverend and her surrogates. Uh, they will be, uh, begin to turn on Brisma Joe, and the effort will, is now going to be made to try to force him out. Uh, they don't want to kick him out. They are going to try to probably uh, have him uh, bow out gracefully, and it'll have something to do with a medical issue or something like that. So, anyway, I, I see that that's probably the way this is going to go. But yes, Kami Bernie is out. He's cashed out. Uh, he'll he'll pocket lots and lots of millions of dollars on the deal. Uh, he'll likely end up with. Uh, Maybe a golf stream or another t sort of private jet, uh, maybe another vacation home, uh, maybe uh, a nice uh, seven-figure uh, chunk of change in his bank account. Uh, certainly, uh, they found his number. That's what this tells me. So there you go. Commie Bernie is out. Now, uh, as most of you know, I, as I've said in the last couple of days, I'm totally done with the Dr. Fauci and Dr. Uh, Burke's show. It's, uh, it's uh, run its course. I've had enough of it. And now that we see this thing in the rearview mirror, I think it's becoming pretty obvious to a lot of people that there's a lot of problems uh, with these two, with these two, and um, probably many others uh, that are surrounding Trump there uh, during this crisis. So we're learning about the connections uh, between uh, Fal uh, Fauci and Burks, their connections to the deep staters, the globalists, the Clintons. In fact, here we have, we find that Dr. Fauci's wife donated $1,200 to the Rotten Reverend Clinton in 2016. This, of course, uh, in, uh, of course is um, consistent with uh, Dr. Fauci himself's love letters to the Rotten Reverend Clinton, uh, three or four love letters that he wrote uh, during 2016, uh, 2015 and 2016. Um, and we also know that uh, Dr. Fauci and his wife attended a Democratic Party fundraiser for the Rotten Reverend Clinton about a week before the election in 2016. Uh, and there was a picture of uh, Fauci and his wife uh, with a group of other uh, 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 Clinton uh, uh, surrogates and Clinton aides and Clinton people at this Democratic Party fundraiser a week before the 2016 election. Uh, now we find out, of course, that Dr. Burks's husband um, donated $8,100 uh, to the Hillary for America campaign in 2016. It's getting kind of sporty out there. Uh, and, of course, um, Dr. Burks' husband also served in the Bill Clinton administration. Yes, that's right, the Bill Clinton administration. So there you go, Fa uh, Fauci and Burks. And it just seems like when you look at this now, hail. 
Heavy rain and hail right now, my friends. Okay, lightning, thunder, hail. I feel the cool-ass breeze blowing in. Things are getting uh, mighty sporty out there. Again, I may end up finishing this video in Kansas. Uh, so here we have uh, Fauci and Burks. And when you look at this, particularly with uh, Fauci, and I've had enough of him. I, I, I'm done with him right now at this point. Um, but it just seems that uh, if you look at Fauci specifically and Burks to some extent, early on in this so-called crisis, uh, they, they sort of underreacted gave us the impression, gave the president the impression, oh, well, this is nothing really too much, we'll keep an eye on it, but nothing really to get too concerned about. So they really under-responded or under-reacted early on with the coronavirus, and then once it became obvious that this uh, had already uh, had its seeds planted in the United States and other places around the world where it was too late to do anything, then they went into massive overreaction or over-responsive mode. So it it doesn't look like they've been quite uh, the superstars that, that they that they're being made to be. In fact, it, it appears that they're either somewhat incompetent um, and were wrong, or they're very competent and they are a part of just another plot to uh, make the president look bad. Uh, so take your pick. Uh, you know, again, we find ourselves in this predicament many times, trying to figure out: are these people just incompetent or are they crooked? <laughs> And a lot of times it's a combination of both. And I think that's probably true in this case as well. I'm telling you, the deep state, man, the deep state, it's everywhere. It's the health and human services. It's, it's the scientists. It's the doctors. It's the transport. It's, there's not a single bureaucracy in the swamp that has not been completely taken over by the deep state. I mean, I'm 700 miles from the place, and I can smell the stench from here. So, yeah, there's a lot of things that are, that are, that are uh, starting to look pretty bad for Fauci and uh, Bricks and that whole group, uh, Burks or whatever her name is. Uh, in, in the rearview mirror, things are starting to look a lot different. Well, I mean, they, they told us uh, initially they under underestimate the situation and get it wrong, under under respond or under react. Then when they finally do get on the ball, they tell us we could be looking at 200,000 plus deaths, uh, and now. Uh, then a, w a couple of days ago, last week, they come out and start talking about, well, the models that we used appear not to have been very good. <laughs> yeah, models put together by your deep state friends. Uh, maybe that's why. Uh, maybe the models are cooked to give exactly the type of um, uh, analysis uh, that someone wanted <laughs> from those cooked models. Um, so then he comes out and says, well, you know, the models were wrong. And now they've uh, dropped the number down to 60,000. 60,000. Well, 60,000 is about the, about the average number of flu deaths that we have every year in this country just from the normal flu. So we've done all of this damage to the economy, probably ruined a lot of small businesses, set the economy back, created all these problems for a lot of people. I mean, this has created a lot of problems for a lot of people, particularly single moms who have kids. They have they try to find someone to watch their kids now. They can't go to school. So they got to make a choice. Do I go to school or do I go to work? I mean, it's just, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, when you look across the country, uh, three, 300 million people, you probably have uh, tens of millions of, of, uh, of, of people who have really been greatly inconvenienced, have lost a lot of money, have had to endure a lot of crap uh, throughout this, even though they've had no illness. Uh, they don't know anybody with any illness. Uh, they're perfectly fine. Uh, their companies were doing fine, uh, and now all this has happened, and it has a lot to do. It lays pretty much at the feet of the people advising the president. He can only go on the advice he's given, and he trusted these people, uh, Fauci and Burks and some of these other people, deep staters, and they've given him some very bad advice, and now he's taken the heat for it. And, um, and uh, it just it just stinks. Okay, it just stinks. And I think uh, a lot of you know what I mean by that. <clears throat> okay, so let's move on to the next story. Uh, well, so now, for many of you who've been watching my videos for a long time, you know that I spent a lot of time about two years ago, we discovered this thing called the Interagency Task Force, or the multi, uh, multi, uh, multi intel task force. There's various names have been given to it. Now, about two weeks ago, we get the story that drops that tells us that Durham has finally closed in on the nucleus of where all this 
raw intelligence came from that made up the ICA, the Intelligence Community Assessment, which is what was used to uh, get Uncle Bob the Executioner, executioner uh, appointed uh, to, to pull off the coup on Trump. It's what allowed them to go pursue these uh, more uh, FISA renewals on Carter Page, to go after Manafort, to go after Cohen, to go after Papagalopoulos, and all this. All of it really launched because of the ICA. So Durham digging into that to find out what's going on, and he and he finds this sort of uh, sort of the nucleus or the kernel, if you will, um, of all of this intelligence activity and where the roots of the uh, information that was put into the ICA came from. And so he discovers this uh, National Intelligence Council, which we learn falls under the ODNI, the Director of National Intelligence. That would be James uh, the Willing Idiot Klepper. And, uh, of course, it's staffed mostly by CIA people, which would be John Brennan. So now we have a story out uh, that is uh, by Bob Terrell, and he is basically pointing out uh, from his sources, uh, is basically telling him that this National Intelligence Council is essentially the same thing as the Interagency Task Force or Multi-Agency Task Force or whatever you want to call it. This secret task force that Brennan set up uh, to provide the raw data he would use to put into the ICA came out of this National Intelligence Council, which we're now being told uh, is one and the same as this interagency task force. They are the same thing. The interagency task force is the National Intelligence Council. And we now know that John Durham has drilled down on that nucleus and that he has interviewed, he has interviewed, uh, individuals, we don't know if he's interviewed all or some, but he's interviewed individuals on that National Intelligence Council. And of course we know that the top three people on that National Intelligence Council, one of them was Eric Sheramella. Sheramella, the fake whistleblower. So we can assume that it's a very good possibility that Durham has interviewed Sheramella. And if you interview this guy, you have a lot of questions for him because he's been involved in everything. He was involved in the working with Alexander Chalupa and the Ukrainian folks uh, to cook up the stuff to try to get a coup against Trump from Ukraine. Uh, he's the one who was involved with Chalupa to try to get this black uh, ledger, which took down Manafort. Um, he's in, been involved with, the, of course, the Whistler. He is the Whistler, I guess, uh, from Ukraine, the Ukraine hoax. So when you sit down with Sheremela, <laughs> you probably have a lot of questions for him. And again, that's why a lot of people believe that that had something to do with the Atkinson firing because Sheremela and Atkinson and um, Mary McCord seem to be this little nucleus. These three were in key positions uh, during 2016 when all that crap was going on. They were in key positions in 2017 around the ICA. They were in key positions uh, around the Ukraine uh, whistler hoax. So these all three, these major really key things you find Sheremela, McCord, and Atkinson all involved uh, in all of these things. And uh, my guess is, is that's not gone by Durham and his investigators. They obviously know everything we know and more. So uh, that's an interesting thing to uh, take note of. Um, and I said many, many, well, two years ago when I first discovered this, and we first learned about this uh, multi-agency task force actually from uh, an article that was written by a former uh, intelligence official in the UK and uh, he wrote this story back a little over two years ago and uh, where he basically said, oh yeah, well, you know, British intelligence works with American intelligence a lot and of course the American CIA and the NSA and all this kind of stuff and of course there was actually set up a task force. Uh, Brennan actually set up this task force in the spring. Uh, late February, early March of uh, 2016, set up this task force, and that's where we first learned about it. And then it, uh, then uh, Paul Speary and some other people did some work on it here in the states. Followed up on it, did some digging on it. Uh, Jeff Carlson did some digging on it. Uh, did a story at uh, the Market's Work. Uh, this is before the Epic Times um, uh, actually uh, was online, because now he works primarily for them, but he still has the Market's Work. But at that time, it was. Uh, just Jeff Carlson at the market's work. That's where he first dug into this and uh, he revealed a lot of information. So now we can kind of see where, where Durham has dialed into the nucleus of all of this and, uh, and these 
when you get to the nucleus of it and you also find the, the characters, the players, and again you find out where it's the same group of people time and time again, whether it was in 2016 uh, with Operation Crossfire Hurricane and all the frame-ups that they were trying to run on Papagalopoulos, Michael Flynn, uh, Roger Stone, Neil Caputo, or uh, Michael Caputo, and all these people, um, and probably more that we don't even know about. Um, and then, of course, you get into the uh, Mueller investigation, which is uh, brought forth by the ICA, uh, of course, and all the stuff that occurs in uh, 2017, these same characters always the same characters. It's the same people over and over again in this small cabal. And um, and it's always these people, kind of top tier people. People who work out of Maine Justice or Southern District of New York working with Maine Justice. This is where you find the nucleus of, of all these uh, people, uh, this sort of cabal of coup plotters. And there's, uh, there's a, probably a list of maybe uh, 25, 30 uh, individuals here, which would include Comey and Clapper and Brennan and Yates and uh, of course, Strzok and Page, and uh, a couple of these other FBI agents uh, identified as Agent 1 and 2, uh, these lawyers, Klein Smith, uh, you know, of course, McCord, uh, all these people. So there's about 30, 35 people, it appears. And then, of course, there's, if we get into the Obama administration as cabinet, uh, then you get into people like Susan Rice, Samantha Power, uh, Rhodes, Ben Rhodes. So, you know, you start to get all these other people get drug into it as well. So uh, ultimately, um, we are learning that, of course, we just learned that uh, when Durham came down here uh, about uh, two weeks ago at the end of March, uh, he normally comes down every couple weeks, flies down here, has a few meetings, goes back home. But uh, he's staying in D.C. He's in D.C. as far as we know right now. And the word is out that pretty much that uh, uh, he is getting ready to, to uh, question John Brennan. Uh, that is why he's in D.C. He is preparing to question Mr. Potato Head because he's apparently pulled together enough uh, information. He's interviewed a lot of people, CIA, NSA, FBI, uh, and intelligence people, um, FBI, NSB, the National Security Branch, the DOJ, NSD, National Security Division. He's interviewed all these people. Uh, he's interviewed people within this National Intelligence Council. Uh, he's interviewed foreign intelligence assets. He has interviewed private uh, intelligence assets, so he's uh, gotten all the emails, schedules, and calendars for Mr. Potato Head, and uh, probably Clapper as well. So he's now amassed all this information. He's had all these interviews going on. Obviously, he came to uh, Washington uh, for meetings on high-level targets of his investigation, uh, so it looks like he's pretty much accumulated uh, a lot of the information he needs, and now what he's preparing to do is to interview Brennan. Now, that, that can go either way. Uh, a lot of times you don't want to interview the target uh, because um, you don't want to tip him off to, to what you're going to do. You'd rather catch him cold uh, in the front of a grand jury. Uh, but then again, you can also, also interview him and not tip your hand to them very much. Uh, just uh, give them as little information as possible while you try to extract information from them. It's also possible that Brennan is not the top target. <laughs> While we may look at and think of, well, Brennan would be the top tier guy here, Brennan Clapper, maybe Comey, top tier. Maybe they're not. <laughs> maybe maybe uh, Durham has, has someone else in mind as being a more of a top tier player and that he will try to get Brennan to drop on that person. So it's really hard to know exactly what's going on in Durham's mind other than the fact that um, as we have followed his investigation, uh, we've, we've watched his investigation, how he started in Europe he went to the UK, he went to Australia, he went to uh, Italy, uh, he tried to find out what the hell's going on with the MISFID, uh, he tried to talk to intelligence people in the UK to find out what they were involved in. Uh, we can assume that he's already done a fairly deep dive on Confusion GPS, CrowdStrike, and uh, these private organizations, these individuals also part of this collective uh, of people. So he's obviously narrowing things down and uh, he's getting ready to start talking to some of the top tier people. Um, and uh, it appears that that's where he is right now. So that's good information to know. Uh, also, we have uh, another thing that's uh, developing. I don't think it's going to go anywhere, but we've been hearing about this for a few more for a few days now. Kind of on the political side, we know that they're trying to get another um, stimulus type bill. This would be number four. And of course, uh, Madam Botox, uh, Pelosi Galore, working with uh, her Democratic operatives. Again, just like they did in the last one, they're going to try to shove a lot of their Democratic uh, garbage into this bill 
Republicans telling us that they're going to fight it and not let it happen. It seems like the major thing that they are pushing, the major thing that they are trying to push, that they want to get into this stimulus bill, not that it has anything to do with helping individuals or small businesses or anything like that. It's just more political garbage, uh, just like the stuff we saw in the last bill. But um, the three things that they are focusing on has to do with voting. <laughs> Yes, they're pushing three specific things uh, that they want to get into this bill. One would be this vote by mail. Vote by mail. To me, that means, to the demo commies, that means cheating by mail. Cheating by mail. Yes, when you're, when you're mailing it in, <laughs> man, you give the Democrats that type of a deal. My God, uh, you, will, you, will, <laughs> you, you can't believe the level of voter fraud if you allow the Democrats to have something like that in their, uh, in their toolbox. Uh, they're also wanting to bring in ballot harvesting. Of course, we know all about bar uh, ballot harvesting. That's one of the reasons we lost control of the House in 2018, because of all that ballot harvesting that they did out in California. Uh, if you remember, in the midterms, <clears throat> um, on the night of the election, there was about, I think, eight seats, sit eight seats being held by Republicans. And, and those uh, eight seats, Republicans were ahead on the night of the election. And I think it was seven of the eight. And then we had to wait another week or two to find out the final results. And when the final results came in, those seven seats, uh, seven of the eight seats were lost by Republicans, even though they were winning on the night of the election. But through ballot harvesting, they were able to harvest some more votes. And that lost, uh, that cost us like seven or eight seats out in California. Now we're going to win some of them back in 2020. We can always see the polls now showing that that's the case. So we're going to win some of them seats back. But no, this ballot harvesting is a horrible, horrible idea. I mean, you'll have every illegal in the country voting <laughs> with ballot harvesting. Um, that's where they basically go door to door. People just go door to door uh, with, with, a, with a voter registration card. And, you know, whoever opens the door, they register them <laughs> and uh, take their vote. Yeah, yeah, you're so and so? Oh, good. No ID. Don't have to prove anything. Just someone open the door and give us a name. And an address. Got a name? Got an address. Good. Who you want to vote for? Oh, good. Democrat. Oh, Republican? Throw it away. Democrat? Save it. Turn it in. That's how ballot harvesting works. It's fraud. It's voter fraud. These are both uh, voter fraud is what these are. And, of course, uh, they also want to have vote anywhere. Huh. You can vote from the street corner. You can vote anywhere. So there you go. Vote by mail, ballot harvesting, and voting anywhere. These are the three ideas that they're going to try to push into this bill. Now, what you need to know about this is the person who's actually driving this, who put all this together, uh, put the legal language together for the demo commies, and the one who's really driving all of this and trying to, uh, he's sort of the, um, the intermediary, the push-pull guy that's uh, trying to move this through um, uh, the Congress using the demo commies and Madame Botox uh, to do it. Uh, the guy who is behind all this is someone whose name we've heard over and over again, right? Mark Elias. That's right, Mark Elias. Mark Elias, the rotten Reverend Clinton's lawyer. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Mark Elias, the one who actually drew up the contract for the rotten Reverend Clinton uh, between her and uh, his law firm and Confusion GPS. Uh, he was the uh, rotten Reverend Clinton's lawyer uh, for this law firm uh, that she used who actually did the legal uh, framework to the legal uh, paperwork and all that, uh, which allowed the Rotten Reverend Clinton to hide behind uh, his law firm, Perkins Cooey, and Confusion GPS. He's the tricky dick who put all that together. So it's that same tricky dick, Mark Elias, former uh, crooked lawyer for the Rotten Reverend Clinton, who's behind this. <laughs> the demonic buzzard is circling overhead. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll be back tomorrow with more Towergate. You guys have a good night. See you. Bye.